Good evening. My name is Tim Oski. I am the board chair for Destination Angels Camp. I'm joined this evening by my esteemed colleague, Lori Giannini. I said it wrong. <laughs> Giannini, our board secretary. We have the honor of being your moderators for this evening's event. On behalf of Destination Angels Camp, the Calaveras County Association of Realtors, and Angels Camp Business Association, I would like to welcome the candidates and all of you to tonight's evening. We will do our best to keep this moving along in a timely manner, and the Calaveras County Association of Realtors will help us by keeping time. So for you folks up here, um, there'll be a 30-second warning and then a hard stop with the big sign. <laughs> um, also, I would like everyone to know that uh, our city administrator from Angels Camp, Ms. Rebecca Callen, is in the lobby, and she's helping folks out with the Angels Camp Community Assessment Survey. Uh, Rebecca will be sticking around hopefully till about 7.30, so if you haven't had a chance to uh, do that survey or, or figure out how to do that survey, Rebecca can help you with that, so we'd appreciate that as well. This evening's information is an education uh, event only. It is to help voters and it is not an endorsement for any one candidate or measure. Before we begin, will you please rise and Lori will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Lori. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first round of speakers for this evening. First up, we would like to hear from our Calaveras County Clerk and Recorder, Rebecca Turner. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, as I was introduced, Rebecca Turner, the County Clerk Recorder and Registrar of Voters, which is why I'm here tonight. Um, before we start off the candidates of it, I just wanted to tell everybody some of the current things happening with the upcoming election, which include two contests for U.S. Senate on the ballot. So that's confusing to some people, but um, we're voting for a six-year term and then also for the remainder of the current term that ends just in January of 2023. Um, we also just, uh, the state mailed out the voter information guides. They're currently in the mail and you should be receiving those shortly, um, your state pamphlets. Our voter information guides will come with your ballots and those will be mailed out the week of October 10th. So um, if you don't get your ballot, you can always log into wheresmyballot.com. Um, it's wheresmyballot.sos.ca.gov and it will track your ballot and tell you where it's at. Also, when you return it, that same will tell you when it's received by the elections office and if it's been counted yet or not. So kind of a handy tool to have if you're concerned with your ballot location. Um, vote centers open um, in San Andres. We open October 11th um, and we're open for 30 days. If you want to vote in person, you can actually scan your ballot in there for the 30 days prior to the election. Um, Valley Springs opens 10 29th, so October 29th, so you have 11 days that you could vote in person there, scanning your ballot in. You can also mail your ballot in in that time period, and then Angels Camp here at Bret Hart Theater and McCallum Hill Town Hall opens November 5th, so Saturday, Sunday, and Monday before Election Day. Um, election results will be available at 8 p.m., and other than that, I'm not intending to use my full five minutes, <laughs> but if anybody has any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them. I also have staff outside next to Rebecca Callen, and um, we have voter registration cards out there and voting locations if you're interested in that information. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. Next, we will hear from Mr. Dana Nichols, uh, the representative to speak on behalf of Measure A. Dana, Thank you. you have five Thank minutes. You, Tim. Five minutes. Uh, greetings. I got involved in fire issues because I live in San Andreas, very close to my local fire department, and began volunteering there as a CERT, Community Emergency Response Team volunteer, about a dozen years ago. 
The CERT team eventually folded, but I continued to volunteer, and I've been driving what's called the breathing support, which is a great big truck with a, a compressor on it to refill the air bottles after a structure fire. So I go all over the county because there's only one mobile breathing support in Calaveras County, and in the process, I learned what happens at larger incidents, and that is that in a large incident, it isn't just your local fire engine. You get fire engines from the neighboring communities. So, for example, in spring of 2020, when there was a house fire two doors up from me on Broadway Street in San Andreas, there were engines from Calaveras Consolidated, McCollumney Hill, uh, Central Calaveras, San Andreas, Altaville Malonis, all there helping with that incident. Uh, and that mutual aid is really where Measure A ultimately comes from because all of the fire districts work together and we talk to each other. We have several organizations. There's both a chief's uh, a organization and then there's also now a Calaveras County Fire Services Joint Powers Authority, which is a governmental entity, although it has no money and no budget, but it allows the fire districts in Calaveras County to cooperate. So for example, we can get a cheaper price on things like diesel uh, repairs if we as a group negotiate with a mechanic to do that. And we also can present a united front when we uh, go to the Board of Supervisors to ask that the Board of Supervisors address whatever the needs are that we're asking them to address. So the Joint Powers Authority is one of the ways we started talking about the dire financial situation of the fire districts in Calaveras County. I was shocked when I got on the board at San Andreas Fire Protection District, where I now serve, and learned how little reliable revenue the district had. When I started four years ago, the district only had about $250,000 a year of reliable revenue, which is barely enough to keep the lights on and pay the chief and pay the insurance and maybe uh, some small stipends to volunteers. Uh, instead of having reliable revenue, what most of the districts do is basically hire themselves out as fire mercenaries. There were many years where San Andreas Fire District would earn five hundred dollars or $600,000 by renting our engines and our crews out to the Cal state of California to fight fires in places like Malibu or Redding, uh, far away from Calaveras County. And unfortunately, that's not a reliable way to fund a fire district because every year is different with the big fire. Some years we would make that money, other years we did not. And when we did not, we ended up draining down our savings to try to keep firefighters on the engine and ready to go 24 hours a day. So we began talking, the other fire districts face similar challenges. One of the ones that actually has the least reliable revenue is Altaville Malonis, which is right here based in Angels Camp, but technically serves the uh, unincorporated area wrapping around the city, around Angels Camp. And uh, it has very little reliable revenue. It's, it's less than 200,000 a year. The city of Angels Camp does cooperate closely with Altaville Malonis, which is a wonderful thing. And that way, you have more firefighters to respond. So when you have a call in Angels Camp, Altaville Malonis will help. And when there's a call in Altaville Malonis, Angels Camp will help. And that basically means you have twice as many firefighters available for an emergency as you might otherwise. Anyway, the fire agencies started talking to each other about what could we do, and we did an educational campaign to try to educate some members of the public, at least, about the situation. And out of that, a citizen committee formed to decide to address it by doing a citizen-based initiative, a petition to get a ballot measure to fund the fire districts. And this was a very unique case in that there was no big money from outside to fund it. It was truly a grassroots effort. We got the signatures. It's now going to be on the ballot for this fall. And I really urge you all to help support your local fire agency and stable staffing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. Next up, we have... Christy Miro, the representative speaking on Measure E. Christy, you have five minutes. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christy Miro, and I'm here as a community member um, supporting Yes for Measure E. Measure E is a bond that will be going on the November ballot uh, for Mark Twain Union Elementary School District. 
We have two schools in the district, Mark Twain Elementary here in Angels Camp and Copperopolis Elementary in uh, Copper. Both schools provide a rigorous and stimulating yet caring educational program for its students. Mark Twain was built 69 years ago and Copper was built 70 years ago. The district has always repaired and maintained the classrooms and facilities at both sites to the best of their ability with limited resources. In 2004, the district's voters approved Measure K, which constructed the new gym at Mark Twain, completed much needed repairs at both schools and began preparing for substantial growth in Copperopolis. However, much of the anticipated new residential construction did not and has not occurred. The district had to amend their plans accordingly. Now, nearly 20 years have passed since that bond and more needs have been identified at both campuses. A recent comprehensive assessment report identified more than $30 million in total facility needs at Copperopolis and Mark Twain. The board evaluated all available sources of funding, including state TK facilities grants, state facilities matching funds, money the district has saved over the years, as well as, a new, as, well as this new bond measure. After careful consideration and prioritiz prioritization, the bond unanimously decided to place Measure E on the November ballot. Measure E is a $9.3 million bond that will help the district meet most, critical, most of the critical facilities priorities in the coming years. We invite you to learn more about the needs of the district and Measure E by reading the FAQs that we have outside at our table or visiting our website. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or if you would like to schedule a tour of either campus, we can also facilitate that. Thank you. On to the Yosemite, Yosemite um, College District. And we have two candidates. One could not be here this evening. So I'm going to read a statement from Don Davis. I recently retired as superintendent of the Waterford School District and had this Hawaiian trip previously planned. My apologies. YCCD deserves a, a governing team that's committed to responsible, responsive, and accountable leadership. I've worked with boards to approve balanced budgets, negotiate labor contracts, complete construction projects on time and under budget, and provide educational programs that meet the needs of a diverse student body. I will use this experience to help the Yosemite District Colleges succeed in being the best they can be. As superintendent, I've seen many students enroll in community college hoping to achieve the dream of a degree or certification. For many, they are the first in their family to go to college. Unfortunately, some high school students in our area don't make it. They fall away during the summer. There's no warm handoff from one institution to the next. I want to work on the warm handoff from high school to college. I'll use my experience of K-12 education to influence other trustees to invest in building strong partnerships with regional high school, ensuring greater access for all students, especially those who in the past convinced themselves that additional education was not for them. In my school district, we provide adult education. I believe our community colleges must support the needs of working adults seeking education by providing coursework that is relevant to trends in the in industry and leads to a degree or to skills certification. And to learn more about Don, you can go to don-davis.org. Thanks. And with us, which is very exciting, we have Tyler Jackson. And Tyler, um, I'll give you two minutes once you go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Tell us about you. <coughs> Hi everyone, I'm Tyler Jackson and I'm running for the YCCD uh, board seat. And I believe Calaveras is about 14 precincts, so look for my name on your ballot. Um, and if I'm there, you're in my district. Um, I'm a first time candidate, so this is one of the first times I'm coming out and meeting all of you and it's really exciting. Um, my connection to uh, the district is I live in Tuolumne County and I work for Tuolumne County. Uh, I work in social services. I do child abuse prevention work. 
Um, I did go to community college. I think community college is a really strong tool for communities, um, both for students coming out of high school, but also uh, for non-traditional students who are getting continuing education uh, as adults or going back for your degree. Um, as a community college student, I was on the accredi accreditation committee and I was also on tenure committees. Uh, I transferred to UC Davis, which is how I ended up in Northern California. Um, and on there, I was on a board of a nonprofit uh, student housing organization uh, where I oversaw the, um, the remodel of a historic property, um, residential property there on campus, uh, which was a really big deal. Uh, in terms of what I think uh, the direction of the community college goes, I think this district is unique because we have Columbia College. Uh, it's on a board of, there are seven seats on the board and there's only one representing the Columbia College area, which I think really puts us at a disadvantage. Um, and so I think really working to bridge the, the divide between us and, and those other board members and getting them to believe that resources should go to our community um, is important. Uh, I do think that the high school, uh, oh, sorry. No, oh, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Tyler, what are your ideas to expand opportunities um, <clears throat> through classes and programs for the Yosemite College District? All right, um, so I think that the, the pipeline from high school to Columbia College is important. Um, I'd like to see more improvement in uh, dual enrollment, um, although in talking to people that work at Columbia College, uh, they're thinking that they do that pretty well, um, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, however, they did talk to me about um, the non-traditional students, those people who are struggling in the district, um, those people who really could use you know, more education to gain more skills, to learn more workforce skills. Um, so helping those people uh, connect with the college, which pre presents a unique challenge. And so working with local organizations, partnering them with the college would be great. Um, to identify workforce needs and also to find people to go. Um, I think that's really key to pathways to success as part of the college. And yeah, that's kind of what I, those are kind of my ideas. I think some of the, the topics that you could cover, I mean, obviously there's the fire program that's there. Uh, I, I was actually just talking to Don here. He said that there's you know, they get some graduates there. Um, another idea might be partnering with the, the airport, the Columbia Airport, um, because I'd, I'd really like to see some development in that um, because that's a really up and coming career um, that, could, that people could really connect to. Um, so getting students pilot's license, and that could even be partnered with dual enrollment, and you could get uh, high school students with pilot's lessons. Uh, pilot's licenses, and then they could go out and have a direct connection to airlines or to uh, to carriers like, um, you know, like FedEx or whatever. Okay. Um, the next question is, in your opinion, Tyler, how do you see the role as a college district trustee, and how would you keep your constituents informed? So the role of the trustee is obviously um, to keep in mind fiduciary duties and uh, try to balance the needs of the students, of faculty, of uh, staff members at the college, and also the community, obviously. And so I, I'd really love to connect with more community members um, at uh, forums like this, but also through email, um, and going out to events, because uh, I think that's really important. And partnering with local businesses um, and local business organizations would be really good uh, to identify the needs um, of the community and of those businesses so that we can then turn around and find the most appropriate 
curriculum for students and get them uh, you know, contributing to the workforce. Thank you. <clears throat> what are some of the ideas you have to encourage enrollment? One of the big pushes that they're making right now is attracting international students, um, especially for the summer program, uh, which I think is a great idea. Uh, but I also think that uh, our community really needs to be enrolled. And so one of the things that I talked about earlier, so encouraging that dual enrollment. Um, where I went to community college in Washington, um, almost all of the high school students there graduated with a two-year degree um, when they graduated high school, uh, which r really gives people a leg up. I mean, from there you could transfer to UC Merced and get your four-year degree in two years. And so I think really encouraging that um, and showing that that's, a, that's an opportunity could um, encourage people to enroll. But then also making the adult programs uh, more attractive and more um, you know, appropriate to the area and making sure that people know about them. Um, so again, you know, working, working outreach, uh, working with the business association um, here in Calaveras and also in Tuolumne, um, that, is, that does present a big challenge because of the, si the size of the district because um, it also includes San Joaquin and Stanislaus. Uh, but getting that outreach, um, w I think, would really help boost enrollment. Great. Um, what makes Columbia Junior College unique from other, college, other junior colleges? So Columbia College is, is up here in the hills, in the foothills. <laughs> 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 which is a beautiful place to be um, and also a very unique um, historical place and being close to you know the danger of fire I think a lot of us can feel that and I don't I don't know that many community colleges face that issue I know they, they don't face it so hard in Modesto um, and so having that fire program, I think, is really, is really special. Um, having the opportunity to be up here, so kind of out of the way, but still have that connection is also, I think, really unique. And then using that, leveraging that to, to go, you know, transfer out um, even to the nursing program at Modesto Junior College. So having those connections, I think, is really special. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Tyler. You have two minutes to wrap up. Oh, OK. <laughs> Good um, job. <laughs> uh, that kind of caught me by surprise. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess in closing, again, I think the high school access is really important, but I also think the non-traditional student access is important, um, partnering with local businesses um, for workforce development. Um, I think transparency and governance, transparency and budgeting is also very important and I feel like a lot of people say that and don't really know what it means and and so I think uh, being able to do that outreach and communicate to the community what is going on um, I think that's being more transparent than than not saying anything at all you can say yeah we're transparent come to the board meetings well the, a lot of the board meetings are in Modesto and that's just not that's that's not an equitable way to to provide transparency um, I'd really like to do more connecting with students. Um, and then I'd love for you to connect with me. Um, you can go to my website, tylerforyccd.com. Um, I also have flyers out there. Um, you can email me at tylerforyccd at gmail. I'd love to hear your ideas and answer your questions um, because really the community college is for you all. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you, Tyler.
Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Tyler. Next up, we're going to hear from the City of Angels City Council candidates. We have three candidates running for two positions, uh, two four-year terms, and then we have one candidate that will be continuing on for a two-year term. Um, candidate Caroline Sherado is completing the balance of a four-year term vacated by a resignation. She is running unopposed and unable to attend due to an out-of-work commitment. Um, and then also current mayor Alvin Brolio was not able to attend. I will read something that he prepared for us, if I can find it. Mayor Brolio says, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry I will not be able to attend candidates night as I am away for work. The last four years of serving on the Angels Camp City Council has been a great learning experience for me and something I have enjoyed. It also, it has also been an honor helping this community that, get, that has given so much to me in my life. This is why I'm going to run for another four year term. The city has many exciting projects that will be happening in the future that I would like to be a part of. Water and sewer line replacement, a new housing development, and the Utica Park upgrade, just to name a few. I am dedicated to moving the city forward in a smart and respectful way. I am fiscally conservative, believe in people's property rights, and being a good neighbor to the community. I hope everyone has a good evening, and please go vote in this upcoming election. Thank you, Alvin Brolio. And next we will hear from uh, Isabel Mancata, who also was unable to attend. Good evening and apologies. I am unable to attend this evening's event as I am out of town for a work obligation. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to the Angels Camp Business Association, Calaveras County Association of Realtors, and Destination Angels Camp for hosting this event. I decided to get involved with Angels Camp City Council when a vacancy became available in December 2020. As someone who was raised in Angels Camp and knew how wonderful a community we are fortunate to live in, it was essential to be involved and be a voice for the constituents. I attended Mark Twain Elementary and I am an alumni of Bret Hart High School. Having lived in other parts of the state, I can confidently say there is truly no other place like Angels Camp. I attended St. Mary's College of California in Moraga, graduating with a communication BA and work as a conference and events planner for NASPO. I have worked in both the private and public sectors, giving me a unique opportunity to understand our city's inner workings better. I take the job of being on the city council seriously, and although I am an individual, I feel that most critical part of my role in being a city council member is being a voice for the citizens. In an effort to minimize my carbon footprint, you will not see any Moncada for city council signs. However, I humbly ask for your support and vote to continue representing you in the city of Angels Camp. <clears throat> and live and in person, we have candidate Greg Smith. Greg will be given two minutes to introduce himself and he will be asked four questions and given two minutes to respond to each one, and then at the end, two minutes to summarize. Greg, the stage is yours. You have two minutes. Thank you, Tim. Welcome, everyone, and thank you again to DAC and ACPA for putting this event on. That's very important for the community and important to us, we the candidates. Uh, as I said, my name is Greg Smith. I'm a native Californian. I was born in San Francisco too long ago and lived in the Bay Area most of my young life. My father, being a native Californian who grew up in a good part of his life in the Sonora Groveland area, being born over there, had always had the dream of bringing us back to this area, or bringing our, his family back to this area. So at the, after several years of uh, living in the Bay Area, my family moved to Angels Camp, well, to the main Angels Camp area, and I started my term at Bret Hart High School. You can see my yearbook back there and what I used to look like. I know there's a lot of changes there, but uh, that happens as you get older. 
while being at Bret Hart, I was very involved in different community organizations and, and chapters and things like AFS, American Field Service, and California Federation of Scholarship, CSF, CF, CSF, and of course in drama. In fact, I was thinking that the last time I sat on a stage in this high school, I was in a play, and uh, it's bringing back some good and bad memories. During my term there at Bret Hart in my senior year, I applied for a scholarship and won the scholarship to be the first year-long student to go to Honduras in Central America. I traveled to Honduras, lived with a family down there, and had some amazing experiences. Coming back to Calaveras County and back to this area, I stayed here for a few more years with working at CDF, doing some tutoring, and also um, becoming involved in the community. Later moving down to the Bay Area, I spent 46 years as a global defense contractor in program management. So that seven years ago, I retired and moved up here back to where I love. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Greg, your first question, in what ways have you been of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for city council? That's a very good question, Tim. <laughs> Many of you taught me a term I had never heard before, and that is voluntold. <laughs> as soon as you say yes to an opportunity, there are many more opportunities just waiting right behind that. So I immediately uh, became involved in the community. I'm a member, board member of the Calaveras Habitat for Humanity, a very important role. Uh, Calaveras Youth Mentoring Program, where I'm a mentor for a young man now. I've mentored two, two young people. I'm also a member and officer of the Native Sons of the Golden West, and I also became president of the Bret Hart High School Reunion Committee, and several other committees that I won't bore you with, both locally and... Probably have something to do with the parade coming up. And I was involved in the parade in the past, and I'll be involved in the parade again. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Question number two, uh, describe your top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. Well, obviously you've heard about the new $3.2 million grant that we just were awarded here in Angels Camp for the new and improved Utica Park. One of the things I hope to do while serving on the council is to see that through fruition, make sure that the money is spent wisely and so that we have a park that we can be proud of. I remember asking a young lady to go study with me in that park many, many years ago, and it was not a comfortable place to be in back in the 70s. And I am very excited about that project and hope and pray that we will, together as a community and as a council, make that project come to fruition. With the fire that we had not so long ago that came very close to hurting downtown area, I'm very concerned about fire safety and keeping our areas clear. I know a lot of the rural areas have a tough time doing that, and I hope as city council we're able to work together with the community to keep fire abatement where it should. The last, and there's, it's difficult coming up with just three things. The last I would say is that in community involvement and citizen involvement. I feel that we all need a better, do a better job in, on council as well as in the community to talk to each other and to listen to each other and connect with each other. I asked several people, how many times have you been to a city council meeting or watched it on Zoom? And I was shocked to hear that most people had said never. Yet, they have a lot of opinions on how the city should be. So I hope that we can improve that communication through the community involvement and through outreach. Awesome, thank you, Greg. Question number three, in your opinion, how do you see the role as a city council member and how would you keep your constituents informed? Well, I think the role, the first role of a city council member would be to listen, to listen and to ask. I find a lot of times that people say that they're going to reach out to their community members, community people, but they don't actually come around and ask people. I would like and I plan to talk to people, find out what their concerns are, and bring those concerns back to the council as appropriate. I think that doing that in a way that gets people more involved in the community will make a huge difference in our city going down the road. 
and helping people understand what we're doing and listening to what they want and try to implement those things. I think that is one of the most important things as a council member. I also believe that we have a, a great opportunity here. Our city is in some of the best financial shape I've seen it in in years. And now we have the opportunity to use that money wisely and use it prudently and we need to do that as a city council and as a city. Fantastic. Last question. What are your financial priorities for the city and what are some ideas you have to generate new revenue? Well, every year that we have a new council come on board, the, the discussion always comes up about growing our city. One of the reasons I moved to this area, or moved back to this area, was because I love the rural community. I love the history of this area. But a city has to grow. We have to grow. We have to grow wisely and smartly. And it's not by overtaxation, but it's by doing things in a prudent fashion. I feel that we have a gold mine here. The history of this area, the people in this area that have lived here for generations that are still here is an amazing resource that we should be promoting more to bring more tourism in and about. We have, a, we have the Wyndham timeshare right here in our property that is the most popular timeshare in the United States. And yet how many times do we see those people drive out of that area and drive up the hill? They're missing an opportunity because there's so many things here in this area. I don't know how many people I've talked to who've never been to our museum, even people who've lived here for 15 or 20 years. All of those things generate income and generate interest in our city. And we need that interest, which equates to tax dollars and things like that. So I think we need to focus on that. Fantastic. Thank you, Greg. That's all the questions we have for you. You have two minutes to kind of summarize and wrap things up. Okay. One of the things that I realized when uh, I accepted this opportunity is that this is really a privilege. This is why we are a citizen in a city like this. When someone gives you an opportunity where you can make a difference in your community, you should take that opportunity. It may not be on a city council, it, but it could be volunteering at a fundraiser. It could be volunteering as a youth mentor. It could be volunteering ha for Habitat for Humanity. I don't know if all of you are aware, but we're going to start building 107 workplace homes, affordable workplace homes, right here in our city, in Capello Drive, starting next year. That's an amazing opportunity that I'm proud to be a part of with Habitat. And I'm hoping that with my position on the city council that I can also use that to benefit that progress and do it wisely. Fantastic. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> and thank you to each of the candidates and thank you to the, the folks that spoke on the two measures and, and Rebecca as well. Um, and we will now take a five minute break and then we will reconvene back up here with the Bret Hart candidates and Mark Twain School District candidates. Yep. If everyone could find their seats, that'd be great. We're going to get started. And... I am privileged to welcome the candidates who are running for the Mark Twain School District. And there are three candidates running for two positions. And um, I'm going to give them each two minutes to introduce themselves. So let's start with Scott. Good evening. My name is Scott McMurlin. Good evening. My name is Scott McNerlin. I've been a community member of Angels Camp for the last 28 years. Uh, I went to Mark Twain. Uh, I went to Bret Hart, graduated in 2004. Um, I have three children in the district, going to two, in Mark uh, two at Copper and one at Mark Twain now. Um, I have been a part of the district as far as when I was younger, 
I was a custodian at Mark Twain for a few years. Uh, so I got to meet a lot of the teachers, a lot of the staff, learn how a few things work. Um, shortly thereafter, I left Mark Twain and went to a trade school to learn how to become a diesel mechanic. And it eventually became the district mechanic for Mark Twain, where I was uh, took care of all the buses and some of the building maintenance for about four years. Um, from there, I left and went to CAL FIRE. I uh, was with CAL FIRE for almost four years, working on fire apparatuses um, based out of Tuolumne County. So I've been around for quite some time. I understand how all this stuff works. Um, this process is new to me, and I am absolutely terrified of being up here. So um, I apologize for looking around shaking and sounding nervous, but I'm a little terrified. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to hopefully taking on this next step in life and helping the kids get make things better. Um, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Timothy Randall. I'm Timothy Randall. Some of you know me from my years of teaching at Bret Hart. I've also invested 20 years serving on the Mark Twain Union Elementary School District as a board member. Now there are some who could reasonably argue that running against an incumbent is in part a referendum on that elected official. That makes total sense to me. And I know there appears to be more candidates for board in this year's election for this and many neighboring districts. I remember my experience when I started back in 2002 and I acknowledge it's not easy for new candidates so I want to acknowledge Scott and Crystal for literally stepping up on stage to be heard. I offered to the constituency my experience on the board in the perspective of a parent, coach, community member, as I will continue to listen, to deliberate, and make decisions with my fellow board members to help our students and maintain a sound district. Thank you for coming tonight to listen to the candidates. Thank you. Crystal Molina? Good evening, my name is Crystal Molina and I'm a candidate for the Mark Twain Union Elementary School District Board. I'm a mother of three that have all been part of the Mark Twain District family for the past 14 years. Though as of this year, I no longer have children in this district, I am 100% vested in the education and well-being of our students and staff. I chose to run for board because I believe elementary education plays a critical role in our students' educational life. When my children began their years in early education, I was proud to have them be a part of this district. The students were greeted with a warm smile upon arriving to school. The atmosphere was positive, welcoming, and had that small town feel that I fell absolutely in love with. As the years have gone by, for me, that feeling has diminished. The pandemic was truly an eye-opening experience for many. The state overstepping the authority of parents, our school board seemed to shift or at least it felt that way to me, representing the state rather than, or the state to the parents rather than representing the parents to the state. Over the last couple of years, the relationship between school boards and parents have been compromised, and one of my goals is to rebuild that trust, to bring back that small town feel to our schools, and to restore the faith of the parents and our community and our site administrators, staff, and our school board. I support parental rights and education, transparency in education, providing a safe and healthy environment for each of our students, physically, mentally, and socially. I will honor every word of the Mark Twain Union Elementary School District mission statement. I support education, not indoctrination. I do not support any sort of critical race theory or other divisive teachings in our schools. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to ask each of you, there will be four questions, you'll all get a chance to, each, um, to answer each one for two minutes, and then I'm going to rotate who goes first, okay? So starting with Tim, how, would, how should the school board engage parents and the community within the district? Well, an important part of the engagement with the community is communication and information. Um, the parents need to know 
procedures. They need to know how to uh, communicate back to the board um, that there are certain board restrictions or certain state restrictions that we have and we need to be sure that we go through the proper routes so we don't get any kind of backlash from the county or the state. Thank you. Scott, same question. Would you like me to repeat it or? Please. Okay. How should the school board engage parents and the community in, within the district? Um, just being uh, more, more upfront, more forthcoming. I feel over the last couple of years that um, there's been a, a large gap between what's being brought to us as parents versus uh, what the school board is actually uh, putting out. So being able to, um, I don't know if it be more on social media or if it be more in person somehow, but one way or another, definitely need to get out to the parents a little bit more than what the school board has. Uh, if it's moving it to different school sites, um, bouncing it around, making it easier for parents to access. Thank you. Crystal, how should the school board engage the opinions of parents and the community within the district? I would say, um, kind of to piggyback off of what Scott had just said, social media is a good tool. Um, I think that that's always something good to utilize to be able to open a dialogue. But the communication is number one. Um, I would say maybe putting the word out more. I, I mean, some, most of us know where to find out about the board meetings uh, when they're taking place, that they do alternate at the other, you know, Copper site and then Mark Twain. But maybe trying to be more forthcoming, like put the information out more about when upcoming meetings are so that we can try to get more engagement from parents. I've attended quite a few of the board meetings myself and it's hard to have that dialogue or that open conversation when the attendance is, is low. Um, I had the opportunity when my daughter was uh, the student body president um, of taking her to the board meetings and again, um, a lot of people didn't know what was happening with them, but maybe putting the word out more. Okay, thank you. All right, question number two, starting with Scott. Describe how you would provide quality education for a diverse student population. Well, I feel Mark Twain's done a pretty good job being diverse with everything as far as uh, education for the kids. There, there's not a whole lot that uh, um, needs to be addressed in that area, I feel, because Mark Twain's been really good about um, that all the kids seem to be treated fairly equal. So um, the only thing that I could see is maybe um, the handicap needs to be a little more accessible for some of these kids. I know some of the handicapped kids have a few issues, uh, but hopefully Measure E will be able to help with that. and. Uh, make things a little more accessible. Thank you, Scott. Crystal, describe how you would provide quality education for a diverse student population. I guess at the board level, what I would say is that um, making sure that we have quality curriculum for our students and that training for our staff, our teachers, and involvement, again, is huge with all, all of the classrooms, all the levels of education. Thank you. Tim, describe how you would provide quality education for a diverse student population. I think at both Copperopolis and Mark Twain, we have outstanding uh, teachers who have done great research in looking at the curriculum updates that we've been doing and we've been processing that as the uh, finance allows. And it's a process which allows great input from the committee to come look at curriculum when we're looking at adopting. Thank you. 
Okay, question number three, starting with Crystal. Describe top, your top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. Um, I would say uh, my top three objectives would be starting with um, parent and community involvement. Um, our children are our future, so working together and being involved in our students' education, we can build a strong foundation for them. Um, as I said before, uh, building the trust back between our community and our parents and our site administrators, staff, and our board, and having them know that we hear them and that we want to do what's best for each and every single student that is attending the schools. Thank you. Tim, describe your top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. I agree with Crystal about the communication. I think it's the backbone of any school district of the communication between all the stakeholders and the administration and the board. Um, I, I think we need to continue that. We've uh, brought back the online uh, board meetings because that's more accessible to families who would like to involve themselves with the board meetings and uh, are not able to make it because of family needs. Uh, I want to see um, the development of the use of, I'm crossing my fingers for the, the bond passage and using those funds to help uh, modernize and, and repair parts of our both schools that need it. Um, and, and the third part is, is um, getting more involvement with the parents. Um, I think it's something that we're swinging back from uh, the COVID era where um, we, we had many issues of people not being able to be involved and uh, I think we're seeing an improvement. I see it at the high school, I, I sense it at the elementary school and I think getting more involvement by the community will be beneficial. Great, thank you. And Scott, describe your top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. Community involvement's huge. Um, Copper Elementary has quite a bit of parents involved with what goes on with uh, like the parent-teacher club. Um, I don't see that quite as much with Mark Twain. I'd like to see both sides get a little bit better about that. Um, like Mr. Randall said, the school sites definitely need Measure E to be able to bring them up to um, pretty much par. The buildings are degraded. They're pretty old. Uh, they all need a lot of work, um, a lot of modernization to take place. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just the, the, the communication with, with the parents is huge. Uh, I just don't see it there right now. I think Mr. Randall's right as far as um, the online meetings are probably going to be better, um, make it easier for parents to access. Um, but we definitely, definitely need to get more, more parents involved. That, that's the biggest goal. Thank you. On to question number four, starting with Tim. In what ways have you been of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for the school district? Uh, within the community, um, having having two kids is probably unavoidable to be, become roped into coaching and, uh, and officiating, and I've done that for uh, Little League and soccer, even though I've known nothing about soccer. Um, but uh, like many parents, uh, that, that was my uh, path into uh, community involvement. Thank you. Uh, Scott, in what ways have you been of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for the school district? Um, you know, I, I think my wife's better to answer that one than I am. Uh, she does far more than I can, more than I do. Um, I'm always, I've been gone a lot, uh, working on incidents and stuff like that, so my wife takes up most of the stuff that we're, we do for the school, for the community. 
Um, we try and donate as much time as we can for like uh, the copper PTC, um, but lately it hasn't been able. I haven't been able to give as much time as I'd like. So uh, here in the near future, I, that will change since uh, I'm my uh, employment is changed. So I'll be able to spend more time with, with the school, put more time towards this, and Great. hopefully make things better. Thank you. Crystal, in what ways have you been of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for the school district? Um, I have been involved with our children in the community on different levels, uh, from volunteering in the classroom, attending field trips, organizing a school talent show one year. That was a first for me at Copper Elementary. Uh, the Veterans Day Parade float for Copper Elementary, coaching cheerleading for AMA, for three years, I started a Girl Scout troop in Copper um, and did that with my girls and others for a few years. And many years of being a team mom when my husband was coaching Little League. Thank you. So now you all have an opportunity. You'll have two minutes where you can give a closing statement. And so we are going to start with Scott. Well, thank you everybody for the time for showing up. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, going to school board meetings and stuff, I feel that a lot of the parents haven't been heard. Um, and I want to make it a point that um, parents feel that they, they're being heard. I want to be the voice that, that speaks for the parents that uh, they can trust because they, I have the same ideals and the same goals. Um, I don't... Uh, I feel that the, the state has pushed way too much for way too much control over our children, um, and I'm tired of that. I wouldn't make my kids do something that I wouldn't do myself willingly, like the COVID vaccine. Um, I think it's ridiculous, but that's my personal opinion. Um, I don't think the school should be educating kids on the BLM riots or CRT, um, any of these things. Um, I think it should be left up to the parents. Uh, if it, issue comes up where uh, the school feels the need or the necessity to have to bring it up, then bring it up to the parents and uh, let the parents bring it up to the children. Um, I don't think the school ha should have the place to be able to, to take that upon themselves and, and teach it to the kids. It should be the parents' responsibility. So, thank you. Crystal. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the sponsors for oh, Candidates Night for holding this event and giving us the opportunity to be here. Um, you heard the level of involvement that I've had um, with the kids, the children in our community, and as a concerned parent and community member, I feel the need to become involved on in a different level for our children. Um, again, I support parental rights and education. Every parent has the right to direct the upbringing of their child. Um, and if I am elected for this position, I promise to do my best to represent our community and to be a voice for our community and our voters. Um, your voice, your vote. Thank you. Tim. Uh, several months ago, while sorting through boxes at my house, I found my note card for my first Cannon Snight speech two decades ago. Now, for those here wondering why I still have those cards after all this time, I'd like you to please suspend judgment about the orgulus of my house. My point in reflection on the notes is the lessons I've learned after joining the board and uh, continue to learn. I was an M, but one voice of five members. And while I recognize the limitations on the power and duties of the board, that we still on the board have important decisions about our kids. We all know the last few years have been most challenging for all. There are and have been in the past decisions which may or may not have been popular, but they are and have been made in the best interest of our children in the district. I appreciate your consideration of your vote to represent our district. Thank you for coming tonight. Now we will dismiss our Mark Twain 
um, school board candidates take a five minute break and get the, high, uh, the Bret Hart um, candidates up here. So thank you. Next up, we have the candidates for the Bret Hart High School District. There are four candidates this evening uh, running for two positions. So we have Ace Anderson, Gail Bunge, Bungie. Joan Lark. Bungie. Bungie. Thank you very much. I should have asked you before we started. That's Sorry. Okay. Uh, Joan Lark and Nick Valente. So each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves and share their reasons for running. Uh, let's get started with uh, Ace. Thank you. My name is Ace Anderson. I'm 41 years old and would like to be elected to the Bret Hart School Board. I'm a fourth generation resident of Calaveras County, a Bret Hart alumni, a construction foreman, and a horse and cattle man. But most important job to me is I am a husband and a father. My wife and I have three kids who all attend Mark Twain Elementary where we will be graduating our daughter to Bret Hart next year. I will, I will have kids at Bret Hart for the next 11 years, so I do think I have a little vested interest in what's going on. And my interest in the school board comes with my desire to upkeep the traditions and values that I hold so dearly within the community that I have lived in for almost 40 years with my family. Um, my family is heavily involved in 4-H. I have been a, a beef leader for the Angel Shranis program for the last two years. And um, my daughter has raised four steers, and my um, one son will start this year. My family is also involved in um, countless sports and any type of fundraiser that we can be involved with to help raise money. We try to help out as much as we can. And that's about what I got. Perfect. Thank you, Ace. <clears throat> Next up, let's hear from Gail. Thank you. Um, I'm Gail Bungie. I'm running for another term on the Bret Hart board. My background, um, I grew up in Los Angeles, graduated from UCLA went into early childhood education, have always been in education. I love public education. I love learning. Um, I, was, I started one of the first, directed one of the first latchkey programs in the state. I moved up here when I met my husband like 42 years ago. I uh, worked at Michelson. I've done subbing. I helped write the Healthy Start grant for VUSD, worked um, around parent education program, and then I got on the board. So I got on the board because I was one of those parents that was raising their hand, going into the superintendent. Can we do this? Why haven't we done this? Can we do that? And I finally said, I got to get on the board. And I ran, and I got on, and I learned a good lesson that I was one of five people. And a lot of ideas that I thought I want, really wanted to do, you're, just, you're part of a board, and you're there to supervise the school. What I want people to understand, everybody, is that the board, a school board is responsible for three things, really. One is policy. The school districts are governed by so much policy, and we amend it, we revise it. it. The policies are created from the state and federal government from mandates and laws. That's one thing we do. Number two, we hire and supervise and evaluate the superintendent. And number three, we are responsible for the budget. So that includes everything that's happening, field trips, salaries, um, expulsions. Those are our uh, school district's three responsibilities. We are not lawmakers. We are not legislators. Importance of school board, I know a lot of you out there don't have kids right now in school. If you have kids, like Ace was saying, of course you're gonna be concerned with your schools. 
Also, your schools attract people. Oh, I'm done. Okay, I'll, I'll put it in the end. I can't You're, see you well. I'm sure you'll get, to, you'll get to continue that with the questioning coming up here shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes goes by really fast. Sorry. I'm sorry. Next, let's hear from Joan. Thank you, and I would like to thank the Angels Camp Business Association, the Calaveras County Association of Realtors, and Destination Angels Camp for hosting this tonight. Thank you very much. And I am an incumbent from the Bet for the Bret Hart School Board. I have been on the school board for a while. I'm very involved. I have been on the curriculum committee, the discipline committee, I have been on the um, Executive Council for Special Education, and I have been here when this theater was built, when we've had the facilities expanded for sports. We have an excellent curriculum for our students. We try to have something for everybody. So if they want to go on to college, we want to have courses that will challenge them so that they can compete with anyone from a large city. We have courses for students that want to go into the workforce. And so I think that that's very important. We have a wonderful staff here. They're very caring. And we do have ways for parents to get involved. We wish we could get more involved. We have curriculum committee, we have discipline committee, we have school site council, and we always try to get parents involved in all of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Next, let's hear from Nick. Uh, Nick Bellette, fifth generation uh, Calvary County resident. Uh, my kids will be the sixth. Um, they are, I have a daughter who's a sophomore now, uh, a son who's a seventh grader at Mark Twain. I'm going to have children in this high school for the next six years. And I've always kind of lived under the motto, you know, be involved with what you love. Be, in law, be involved with what you think is right. Um, if there's a sports in this town, I'd probably help coach it. Uh, probably help put on parades. Um, I'm a board member for AMA. Uh, some of my past um, other boards I've been on, Fish and Game Commission for the county, Oak Hardwood Advisory Committee for the county. Um, I was one of the founding directors for the Resource Conservation District when it was founded and voted in by the public. Uh, I was a director for the Farm Bureau. Um, I'm currently on the CCA, Calvary County Cattlemen Association, as a secretary treasurer. Um, I, you know, I put my name out there. I'm willing to put in the time to do what I think is right to support the community. Um, it's time consuming. First person you can ask is my wife because she thinks I'm dating somebody else half the time. Hmm. But I'm not. I'm out coaching baseball. I'm out helping promote a youth sport. I'm out working with Scott or past uh, Mike, you know, superintendent with the high school, trying to secure field time for AMA football, for wrestling in the gym, for AMA basketball in the gym. And um, I spent a lot of this time on this campus, and I'm not a faculty member, uh, but I think being on the school board, especially with having kids going through the next six years, um, is a place I think I can do well. And I hope, you know, the support I've been hearing, you know, falls through. So I just want to say, you know, I'm here, and there's a stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesse, for the stop sign. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. So we have a series of four questions that we're going to ask each one of you. Uh, each one of you will have two minutes to respond, and each one of you will have an opportunity to go first. So I thought that I might start with one of the veterans um, and Gail, if you don't mind going first. How should the school board go about finding out and knowing what the parents and the community and the district are thinking? Oh, 
when I got on the board, that was one of the big issues. How do we communicate with parents? Parents, you're your, your child's first, and you're your, their best and their most important teacher, and no one ever forgets that. A lot of parents at the high school level, by the time the kids have gotten here, they're not involved anymore. OK, they're growing up. This is your chance, kind of your last chance to be really involved. We, as the school board, are, we are out in the community. So we hear things. We, people email us. People call us. But they're really, I think as Mr. Randall said before, the line is to go through the schools. And we are kind of the, that last line. If there's a problem, it comes to the school board. Um, we have started this, we have a new principal last year, and we have a new superintendent this year, and technology is growing. So we invite parents, every year that I have been here, we're inviting you, come to our meetings, come to discipline, come to school site, um, join us. And a lot of parents come here for sports, they come here, of course, for drama and music, and we're always trying to get you. So the meetings now are being Zoomed, as a lot of schools are doing. So if you can't be at one, you can watch it. And we're trying to bring always parents in more and more. As school board members, we always welcome comments, but we always, always urge you to go through the school first. If there's any kind of problem, you go to the teacher, and then you, we have a whole line that you go through. Um, we have encouraged parents to join us at every sports event, as I said, at every play, at every, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. You guys are awesome with the stop sign. Thank you. Um, and we appreciate um, the answers from everyone. So next, same question to Joan. How should the school board go about finding out and knowing what the parents and the community in the district are thinking? As I said, we do have committees for parents to get involved in, and we really appreciate it when they come and they give their input. There are also times when surveys are sent out by the school, and very few people respond to surveys. This is the way you can let us know what you're feeling, what you want, what you don't want. So when surveys are sent out to the parents, please fill them out because it really means a great deal to us. But in the meantime, you can get involved in the different committees, and we welcome the input. Thank you, Joan. Mm -hmm. Same question next to uh, Nick. How should the school board go about finding out and knowing what the parents in the community and the district are thinking? Um, it's kind of a tough question because everybody's a everybody's busy, and I'm busy. Most of everyone out here is busy, so I think a lot of the getting ahead of myself here. A lot of the information is glossed over as just passing as oh yeah, it's a meeting next week, and maybe there are board meetings that are attended that. Nothing serious is done. Um, I'm sure every board meeting has, is serious, but it may not reflect upon that parent's ideas of what's important at the moment. So it's just like anything, people prioritize their time, their kid's time. Um, so I think it always has to be available to them. And, it's just like dealing with your kids. You, you have to blast them with information so they take it, so they really hold on to it. If it's just a kind of a quick wave, hey, this is you know next week, um, it kind of goes over their head. And same way with parents, because we're all busy. And we'll have lives to leave, lead. And I think, you know, Joan makes a good point. You know, committees, be involved. Um, but I think the information to find out where those committees are, how you get on them, what they entail, the time constraints, the time involvement, um, that's, a, that's the part that really needs to be shown 
for the parents to be involved because they're going to make or break the decision on can I can I do it, can I not? Um, I think it just needs to be more available other than a random email in your inbox. Thank you, Nick. And now same question to Ace. How should the school board go about finding out and knowing what the parents and the community and the district are thinking? I think the school board needs to be involved. I think they need to go to sporting events, show up at fundraisers, be at committees, talk to the students, talk to the parents, try to get their intake on and how they feel on what the situations are and how it affects them and how they want us to help carry on everything. And I think um, showing, uh, putting it out there in different ways other than just in person, um, social media I believe is a very strong one. Everybody's on it and it can, you can help get um, take back from that also. Thank you, Ace. Second question, we will start with Joan this time. Joan, describe how you would provide quality education for a diverse student population. I think we do. <laughs> we have courses, we have honors courses, we have AP courses, so that when the students take these, if they, especially the AP courses, if they pass with a certain score, they don't have to take that when they get into college. So it saves money and it uh, can make their college career a little shorter. We also have many different electives. We have, we have not gotten rid of any programs. When we had the downturn of the economy a few years ago, Many of the schools had to give up their electives. We have not given up any of our electives. We still have auto shop. We have our um, technical theater, thanks to David, in this theater. We have floral arranging. We have welding. We still have these courses for the students who don't want to go on to college. So I think that we do a very good job of course offerings for a diverse population. Awesome. Thank you, Joan. Same question to Nick. Describe how you would provide quality education for a diverse student population. Um, I think, you know, um, it's provided pretty well right now. And I think you have to, you know, if being elected to the board, you'd have to look at that template. And there's no reason to take that and throw it away. And if there's ability to grow from it, I think, um, you know, you could put in the time and if it's feasible, you know, within the budgets um, to grow it, to be even more diverse and allow for all kinds of programs to be available. Um, but one thing is, you know, don't throw away what you already know and think you're going to come in and, you know, flip the system on its head. And I think it's a, it's doing pretty well right now within the school. And I think you just need to, Start with that as a good baseline and go from there, high as you can go. Thank you, Nick. Next, we'd like to hear from Ace. Describe how you would provide quality education for a diverse student population. I think the number one thing is communication with the teachers. The, um, they can uh, communicate to us what is working and what areas we need they need help with and then we can help them go through the proper steps and move things along so that it can come to the board so we can vote on um, a way to push it through the other thing is i'm a real i um, feel strong and like elective classes and like ag shop with welding um, mechanics cad all, all the different classes that will help the kids when they go to college or help kids move into a trade school or a trade um, further on in life. Awesome. Thank you. 
Gail. First of all, I want to be clear what we're talking about with diversity. What I want to say is not different ethnicities here, but the type of students that come through our doors, because we have kids who love sports, and that brings them here. We have scientists and mathematicians that come and are working towards getting their higher degrees. And we have the children, the students, who are looking for some kind of continuation um, in a work in a workforce. So the diversity is the type of kids we have. And I feel like this board has always looked ahead, and even more so now, is what type of courses are going to be relevant. We just started a computer programming course, first time. Um, one of our teachers got qualified to do that, and he's got a full class. Our auto shop is... Um, they're working on an electric car now. We just hired a new ag teacher. It's a young woman, young, and she's teaching both shop and welding and woodworking. Um, so we're, when you talk about diverse, we have lots of different types of children. We are just starting an eSports program. If you don't know what that is, it is video gaming. Apologies to my son who said that's a great thing to have. Esports is a sport sanctioned by the CIF, which is the California Inter Interscholastic Federation. I have 30 seconds. Um, this is attracting kids who maybe aren't swimming or playing basketball or volleyball or football. So we are trying to find a place for all the students in their diverse needs and their diverse personalities. I made it before. The stops. <laughs> okay. Great job. Thank you, Yale. You're welcome. Question number three, we'll start with Nick this time. Describe the top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. Um, <clears throat> probably the first one, you know, which is probably the main goal of the board is to be fiscally responsible with the budget and keep it in line and do the best to provide as much as we can within the limits of what we're given. Um, I think second, um, it would be to w try to work well with our new superintendent, Scott. Um, you know, I think there's probably going to be a learning curve on both both ends if I got elected. Um, he would help me, I would help him. I deal with him now a little bit through AMA, and, you know, um, he's, he's going to be a great addition to the high school. And I just think it'd be, he'd be, a, he's one of the objectives that needs to be, you know, focused on is making sure that his job is successful. And third would be, um, I was kind of vague on it before, I guess, but is to make sure all the channels are available, you know, for parents' voices to be heard and recognized to the board and or within the high school. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. Same question, we'll go to Ace next. Describe the top three objectives or projects that you hope to accomplish in your term of office. One of my top objectives um, is communication with the parents and the kids and making sure um, there is good communication and everybody's voices can be heard. And um, knowing how the majority feels on certain subjects. Uh, second one would be uh, the teachers. I've talked to some of the teachers and they would like um, the board to be a little more in tune with what's happening from the day-to-day -day, um, school issues and try and um, help them with discipline, problems, and uh, just different um, areas with their programs where they can ha um, need help uh, to be able to teach the program better. And the third would be trying to teach parents and um, school kids how when they want something done, they can't come straight to a board member 
and push it through that way, teaching them the proper steps, go into the principal who goes to the superintendent, and it has to go down the right um, avenue so we can actually discuss it and try to get something accomplished. Awesome. Thank you, Ace. Same question for Gail. Describe the top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. Our projects change year to year, and it comes to us through the administration, which comes from the staff. Right now, if you were to ask me right now, COVID really did a number on our kids, and you all know that. We need to attract a lot of these kids back to school. A lot of them went to homeschooling, Mountain Oaks, which are great, I'm, I, it's a great school. But how do we attract them and the parents to get them in our school? That's number one right now. Number two, I mentioned before, is to make our courses relevant to what's going on today. Um, we've got some, you, you heard what dual, about dual enrollment. I don't know if you all know what that is. That means that we have a teacher, we have two teachers here who have their masters who are qualified to teach at the junior, um, co junior college level. The kids, we have an English class and an auto class, and the kids taking that are earning credits both in high school to graduate and in junior college. So how do we make sure these courses are relevant? We're trying to attract more of our teachers to do that. Um, the other thing that hasn't been brought up that I think is really a priority right now is safety. Um, I think that's on everyone's minds. I know it's on our board's minds and we talk about it all the time. We, I'm really proud of this administration. They are watching out for the kids in so many ways. We have a safety plan that's like this thick that tells what you do, when you do it. The teachers are being trained in what's called ALICE, A-L-I-C-E, and I'm not going to tell you the names of the acronym, but it's for emergencies. Um, <clears throat> we have a program called Remind where messages go out right away. Suicide prevention um, numbers are posted in every classroom. We have a wellness center now, and we use some of the COVID money that we got so that we could hire an LVN on campus all the time, as well as a full-time school counselor, and we have a school resource officer who um, is a retired from the Angels Camp PD. Thank you. I think Gail could keep going for like 10 minutes on these things. I'm really proud of her. <laughs> uh, next, the same question for Joan. Describe the top three objectives or projects you hope to accomplish in your term of office. The three that I'm going to give, I think, are all important. I'll say one first, but that isn't necessarily my top priority. The three of them are. But the first would be safety, would be our school safety. I believe that we're doing a really good job of that, and we do have our school resource officer back, and I know that that helps the students feel far more comfortable than when we did not have him on campus, or we had a female at one time. The second is I think that we have to make sure that we continue with the courses that will please and help all forms of, or all of our students, all diversities, and uh, we have to keep up with our technology, and we're doing that. And the last thing is to keep our school fiscally solvent. We have never had a problem. We have had great administration and board working together, and we have a fantastic financial officer, and we are solvent. We will stay that way. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. And then the home stretch. Fourth and final question, we'll start with Ace. In what ways have you been in, of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for the school district? Well, I have three kids, so um, I try to help out with sporting events as much as possible. Um, my family's always been involved with uh, fundraisers. Um, a big one's the boosters for the fair animals. And I was... Uh, 4-H leader for the last two years for the beef um, and 
just try to help out in any sort of way. We've got a great community. They always come together and help raise money and in any way I can, whether it be cooking at one of their events or help setting up or tearing down, just helping in any sort of way I can when I'm available. Awesome. Thank you, Ace. Same question to Gail. In what ways have you been of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for the school district? Well, I feel that my service to the school district, being on the school board, is of great service. I consider it a community service. Um, I've also done things like fostered dogs for uh, the Humane Society and FOAC, um, volunteer for the Murphy's Community Club, Feeney Park. Uh, we're working for the grape, my husband and I are working at the Grape Stomp this weekend. Um, I think by being on the board has, well, okay, let me go back. I've been up here a long time. I was a Girl Scout leader. I worked at the elementary schools. I ran the Halloween carnivals. Um, I did the Girl Scouts. I just said that with a friend here. So we've done a lot of things through the years. I think, I believe that being on the school board has been my biggest community service. I don't just go to school board meetings. I am active in discipline committee, site council, curriculum. I go to sporting events. I try to get to the plays and the concerts. Um, I help out here when I can and be of service. I, when I first moved up to this community, I had come from a bigger city, and I went to the market, and everybody talks to you, and I was like, oh my God, I'm never gonna get out of here. Now I love it. I love this community. And as somebody said earlier, I wish we could stay a little more rural. And I love the fact that our kids here are connected to the staff. Um, and so that's my community service, being here. OK, thank you. Thank you, Gail. Same question to Joan. In what ways have you been of service to the community prior to becoming a candidate for the school district? Well, I agree with Gail that being on the board, I feel that that is a good community service. I have also volunteered for um, academic decathlon, which our students participate in every year. And I've been doing, I've been a speech judge for several years with that. And right now, I am prevention officer at Ebbets Pass Fire District, and so I believe that's also a community service. Awesome. Thank you, Joan. Nick, I think you already touched on that, but let's, let's hear some more yeah. of um, what you've done. Like I said, you know, with a personality like myself where you have a problem saying no, um, when you're asked to help out, you help out. Um, you know, AMAU sports, they need a wrestling director. I'm the wrestling director. Um, I'm the football commissioner. I have coached my son in Little League for I don't know how many years he's old, as many years as he could play. Um, you know, I'm a local cattleman, so I've been on the uh, Calaveras County Cattlemen Association I don't, a long time because um, I find it to be important to what's good for the community and what's good for what I'm a part of. Um, Resource Conservation District, I thought it was very important that when it was voted in, that it be formed correctly with local conservative minds on the board. Um, it is since, I think, still in that direction uh, due to, and I've stepped away from it, uh, to let other people, you know, have advantage to, you know, have their input on it. Uh, Oak Hardwood Advisory Committee, you know, you help the county <clears throat> uh, have a, you know, oak tree policy for development that's, that's their own and it's not just blanketed by the state. So you have your own voice as a county on what you think is important or not uh, in the development fashion of saving your oaks. Uh, the Fishing Game Commission, you know, I'm an avid outdoorsman. Uh, most of my family is also. So I think being a part of that was important for how, you know, game is managed and how the community sees um, the outdoorsmen in this neighbor, uh, neighborhood, in this community, up and down Highway 4, because that is a big draw um, for certain times of the year. So 
I've helped put on parades. I've helped put on barbecues. I've helped. <laughs> I love the big giant stop sign. His hand keeps getting higher and higher. I don't think you can deny that all four of these folks have, have contributed quite a bit to this community. So thank you very much. Um, we do want to give each of you two minutes to kind of wrap things up. And I would like to start with Joan. Thank you. I would like to be reelected to the board. I think that the, we, still, we still have a great deal to do. We need to modernize our technology. I believe that I bring a good historical background, and I think that um, we need to keep our school solvent, and I believe that with the background that I have, this can help the board, and it can help the school. Thank you, Joan. Ace. I think our children are the most important part of this community because they're one day hopefully going to want to stay and help develop it develop it in the future um, i also believe the teachers are very very important because they're the ones that are going to help them develop a lot of their skills through the school and help them to decide what they want, how they want to go on and pursue their career later on in life and how that will benefit themselves and our community. So I would just, and their parents, and try to help their parents, let them know the voices can be heard and we can help them in any way that we can. Thank you, Ace. Uh, two minutes for Gail. It's two minutes, huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to finish something I started in the intro is why school, why this board and the school is important. Even if you don't have kids here, we are a community center from this beautiful theater to the pool to the sports complex to the fields that you use for AMA. So even if you don't have children here, this is an important place and you should be proud of it and take an interest in it. I... I'm running again for part of the reason Joan said we have, and I said before, we are transitioning a new superintendent. I have history. I have knowledge. When I got on the board, I thought, oh, okay, I've got a background in education. I get this. I didn't know anything about facilities. I didn't know anything about the budget. It was a huge learning curve. I commend these guys for stepping up, and I know that Things turn over, and we may have turnovers, but I feel like I have a lot. I know I'm honest and responsible, and I have a lot of experience. I understand our budget. I know the teachers. I know the staff. Um, I am still fascinated by education. I'm fascinated by learning what the teachers are doing. When I see, like, your kids are coming, ninth graders come in, and when we go to graduation, Every graduation, I'm in tears because they change from children to adults, and they are going out into one of the most exciting times of their lives. And I want to make sure this is a good place. Okay. The, um, this year, we had school spirit was getting down there with COVID. This year, all of a sudden, it has just built up. And the parade, if you went to the parade or some of the, the sports events or the rallies, the kids are have school spirit again. And I want to be part of that, and I want to see that grow and um, have a, a fun place. I want them to have fun in high school, too, as well as learn. So I hope you'll vote for me for another term. And thank you all for coming and for you guys putting this on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Nick? Let's see. Um, <clears throat> it's, kind of, um, it's kind of one of those things where if you're going to be involved my opinion on how I attack things is you got to go at it a hundred percent. And I think, um, when you have, you know, when you have, I hear a lot of parents, you know, they voice their opinion about not having their boys heard. I'm one of those parents. So what do you do? You get involved. Well, I'm up here in the lights, rambling through my scribbly notes. Um, but I'm going to go at it a hundred percent. You know, because that's what I'm here for. 
because I'm here to keep Bret Hart great, um, to be sound with the budget, because it all starts, I think, in my opinion, it all starts with the budget, because if you have a good budget base, you can have the best teachers. Um, you can have upkept facilities. You can have a great sports complex, you know, like Yell and Joan. You know, they've worked for it. They got it here, but they didn't do it by being, you know, work, walking around with upside down wallet. So I think that's a good step. You know, that's a good basis. I, I want to be focused on is being, you know, fiscally responsible and making it go for the term I'm here, at least if I'm elected. Thank you. Thank you, um, candidates for the Bret Hart Union School District. I, we just want to remind everyone um, that this event was hosted by the Angels Camp Business Association, the Calaveras County Association of Realtors, and Destination Angels Camp. Special thank you to Bret Hart High School district for the use of the facilities. This is a beautiful facility. Just want to remind too that everyone that this is a information and educational event to help educate voters and not an endorsement for any one candidate or measure. On behalf of my co-monitor, moderator, co-host Regis, I think I'll choose Kathy Lee. Um, anyway, we want to thank you guys for coming, and thank you to all the candidates for um, coming out and sharing with us, and a special thank you to our um, executive director of Destination Angels Camp, Debbie Pawnee, who put all of this together. So thank you, and have a good evening. <laughs>